<laughs> Margaret Owens, boy, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> so, good morning. I wanted to look at this idea of remembering and reframing. So speaking of remembering, Herb and Martha are an elderly couple who are wanting to continue to live independently, but they're realizing that they're kind of challenged with memory issues, and life is getting a little bit difficult. So they decide the way they're going to cope with this is they are going to constantly write everything down, write everything that needs to be done so they just don't forget. And that seems to be working quite well for them. And one evening after dinner, Herb decides that he would love to have a bowl of ice cream. He goes to the freezer. There isn't any in there. But he decides he's going to take a stroll down to the grocery store to get some. And as he's about to walk out the door, Martha reminds him, uh, Herb, be sure to write it down. And he goes, oh, for heaven's sakes, Martha, I can remember one item. I can remember ice cream. Martha decides not to argue, so she lets Herb go down to the grocery store. And he comes back about 20 minutes later. And he has his little bag of groceries, sets them down on the table, starts to walk away. Martha looks in, only to discover two large cans of chicken soup. To which she looks up, she goes, oh, Herb, for heaven's sake, I told you to write it down. And he looks at her blankly, not knowing what went wrong. And she says, seriously, Herb, two cans of chicken soup? Still, he's looking at her blankly, and she goes, oh, for heaven's sake, Herb, you completely forgot the crackers. Okay, so may I just say that that little joke is a little closer to home than I would like <laughs> to admit. The last thing my partner Joe said to me as I was getting in the elevator this morning was, ah, you forgot to eat your bowl of oatmeal that's sitting on the kitchen counter. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> So this idea of memory, I thought, was relevant um, as we are in this Memorial Day weekend, um, the theme of which is hardly frivolous, the theme of which is quite poignant, as we're asked to remember those who sacrificed their lives for the benefits, the freedoms that we get to enjoy in our country and our lives today. But I'd have to ask us, how are we supposed to look back and remember? You know, in what ways are we best honoring those who made such huge sacrifices for us as we remember them? You know, because uh, memory is really a very interesting thing, as Herb and Martha and a few other people I can think of could testify to. You know, in Science of Mind, we emphasize over and over again that the most powerful thing we possess is the power of our thought. How and what we think about a situation, be it in the present or in the past, has a direct correlation on how we experience life now. You know, our perspective plays a huge role in how we experience life. And the more we can perceive that underlying essence of God's nature that we say is fully and equally present in everything, in everyone, in every moment, in every situation, including within us, the more we can sense it, even when it's not being fully expressed out there, but as a potential to be brought forth, the more we experience that goodness of God's nature, the more we're open to ways to bring it into expression when it seems to be lacking. You know, this past Wednesday, my talk title was No More Story Time. And I discussed how, as we move through life, we develop stories about the experiences that unfold 
in our lives. And you know, I explained that telling our stories, even those that are painful, you know, where that involve stories about suffering, actually, maybe even more importantly, in those cases, it's, it's necessary for us to share those stories as a way of being able to share our pain and our hurt with others that can open us to a healing process. Sharing about the ways we were hurt, our disappointments, the ways that we feel we've, we've failed. Being able to talk about it can be healing, but at a certain point, it can be counterproductive. If we keep rehashing the story about, oh, how, how I was such a failure, oh, how I was so wounded, and it keeps coming up over and over again, we get stuck in this story and we can't move forward. You know, when we get, can get to the point of recognizing that somehow in the midst of something difficult, God is still there. You know, that there's something in us that's trying to make good of the situation and focus on that. We don't get trapped by the human facts of the story. We don't let them have power over us. We turn to that greater power of God within us to move forward. Now, one of the gifts of time, when there's some time that has elapsed between you know, now and when we experience something that may have been painful or difficult, is that we can remember those situations and look at them reframe them because we can see them from a different perspective. You know, with time we can look back on any difficulty, on the painful events of our lives from a higher consciousness and reframe them in a way that serves us. You know, look back and if we can realize that God's nature in us was greater than what was going on, and it always will be there, now and going forward, that no matter how painful or difficult the situation was, there was some lesson possibly to be gained from it. There was some greater good that we were able to make out of it. You know, when we look back on those situations in that way, we reinforce that sense of God's ever presence within us, that presence that's greater than any worldly condition, and reinforcing that today in our subconscious blesses us. It gives us that greater sense of the good in us, that presence that's greater than any of the conditions in the world that's ever enduring, that's untainted by what goes on out here. I mean, think about it. Could there be anything more empowering you know, it's, it's great when we look upon the good things in our lives and show gratitude and recognize that they came from the goodness of God. That's wonderful. That's actually a spiritual practice that we encourage so that we can know that every good thing we experience comes from an infinite source of good that lives in us. It's always going to find new ways to create good. So that's, that's absolutely a wonderful practice. But what about being able to look at those times that are dark, that are difficult, that are painful, and still have this sense there's something in me and around me that's bigger than what's happening right now. Could anything be more reassuring? Is there anything that could give us a greater sense of feeling that goodness and going for it of releasing our insecurities, releasing our fears, and you know, really participating in life to the fullest versus focusing on where we might fail or how we were hurt in the past and therefore we can't, all of that. If we can look back and say, but wait a second, let me look at these situations and how something in me moved me out of those challenges, and that something is God, and it's in me right now. That is the greatest blessing that we can bestow upon ourselves by opening to that truth. And there's this great saying that I've always loved that it's never too late to have a happy childhood. <laughs> and it really talks to this idea of remembering 
and reframing if our childhood wasn't such a happy one. Uh, I had an example of uh, a client, a woman who came to me who had been in a very, very dysfunctional family as a child. She had one parent that suffered from mental illness. She had another that was uh, severely in addiction. Uh, she was taken out of the home and placed in different places. And she came to understand through attending our services here and something that she had heard Dr. Mark say um, at one of the Mother's Day services years back about, you know, our parents did the best they could. They were operating from their level of consciousness. And she was able to grasp that idea. She was able to utilize it in a way to release her sense of resentment for the way her parents had been to release that sense of condemnation. And that had blessed her tremendously to be able to do that. But then she came to me saying, you know, I can intellectually tell myself that somehow God was there the whole time back during my childhood, but it's only up here. I, I want to get it where I can really, really feel that and understand that. And that's when we started to do some work together. And where we started really was I just asked her to look back in those times and recognize how something in her had always sought to find a way to feel OK, no matter what the circumstances. And she looked at that, and she realized that even as a little girl, there were ways that she had learned to cope. There was something in her that didn't give in to the circumstances that kept looking for a way to make things better. And so she was able to understand, OK, that's the impulse of something in me that's bigger than the circumstance. And then from there, we started looking at, well, how did God show up? Maybe not through your parents as that nurturing, loving energy. But then she started to realize the family members that stepped in that weren't able to adopt, but that tried. She talked about an aunt in particular that was there to try to make up for the love that she wasn't receiving from her parents. Teachers, others that came forward that were there as examples or channels of God's parental love. That God was present, just not where she was looking for evidence of that kind of love. And we then also explored how the experiences of her childhood gave her such a strong sense of the pain that one feels when one isn't in a nurturing, loving environment. That motivated her to become a social worker and to do work for those children who found themselves in the same circumstances as she did when she was a child. So something in her was able to take that experience and make something good of it. And when she was able to remember, go back, remember but reframe that story from that different point of view, she later shared with me, she said, nothing has given me a greater sense in the most difficult times that there's something in me, in all of us, that's greater than the challenges we go through. And so, you know, that's, that's the beauty of a spiritual practice where we are constantly bringing our awareness back to the presence of God and how we can use that looking back on moments where we felt at that time that God wasn't there to see, well, what, what showed up as goodness? What good did I make out of that situation? For myself, and this story came forth since uh, it's Memorial Day, I remember years back, I was in my second home, as you all know, or many of you know, France. 
I had, for all the years of my childhood and even most of my adult years, I had never really been called to go visit the Normandy beaches. But there was one year that my partner and I were there and we wanted to do that. And uh, it was actually a very, very moving experience for me. I guess my consciousness was in a different place to be able to go there. And so we visited Omaha Beach first and it was a gray, drizzly day. And when we left Omaha Beach, we drove up to uh, Pointe Dieu, which is the highest point between Omaha and Utah beaches, which was also uh, reclaimed by the Americans and a lot of loss of life occurred for that to happen. And when we arrived, the, uh, it had stopped raining and there were these areas in the sky where the clouds had parted. So you know that, that look where the sun kind of breaks through in different places? And as we were walking out, I, my partner and I took different directions and I walked out to this area where I'm looking out onto this huge field with these like um, dips that were covered with grass and clover and all kinds of flowers. And the way the light was hitting with the light and the shadow in these dips and the beauty of the flowers. And you know, when grass is wet, it has that glistening look to it when the sun hits it. It was so beautiful. I, I literally stopped in my tracks to just admire the beauty. And it was a while before I realized that these dips that I was looking at were craters that were created by bombs that had hit the area, that this area had been a, a ground of bloodshed of probably the most horrific type of human experience that we can witness. And yet I sat there, you know, with time, when we give up our ideas of separation and being so different and allow ourselves to realign with how much more we are alike, the healing that happens. And I was looking out at this ground and I said, look at what the impulse of life is. This ground that would have looked so horrific at one time now is absolutely beautiful because the impulse of God's life is to thrive, is to create beauty. And I was able to stand there and witness that. I was able to remember what had happened in the past but to feel a presence that was bigger than that, that led to the healing that now the nations that were you know, at war are allies. And as I was standing there, I realized I was standing on the ground of a site that I had read about years back and uh, I hadn't been there, so it, it dawned on me finally that this is this place I'd heard about where back in the 1950s, there were two women who were visiting the site who, as they were walking around, they noticed each other. Uh, both of them were crying. They were crying because their sons had both lost their lives in this area. And at some point, they, they just felt drawn to come together and share a little about their experience. And when they did, they suddenly realized they didn't speak the same language because one was American and one was German. And they both, at first, they were a little bit shocked because they were from the different sides, but they soon realized they were both feeling the same pain. They were both feeling the same sense of loss. And they decided that they found out they were both uh, visiting the same town of Deauville, uh, not far away. They decided to go together to a church in Deauville, and they both lit candles for their sons side by side. And they said, may this be you know, an intention, a prayer, for all humanity to remember how much more alike we are than our differences and to find ways to avoid what happened when our sons lost their lives. You know, 
it was, it was a prayer for that greater oneness that we all share to be more fully known and revealed. And, you know, as I look back, as I look back on that story, and by the way, another thing that they did is they vowed to stay in touch and their families uh, became friends and uh, there were many friendships that were formed out of that one meeting of two people whose sons were on opposite sides at one time. So my invitation to us is to say, as we're called to remember those who sacrificed their lives or as we look back on any dark time in our own lives, in our own human history, I think there's no greater gift that we can offer the world, no greater honor we can pay to those who made sacrifices for us than to look for the good that came out of those sacrifices, to look back, to remember and be grateful for the sacrifice, but focus on the light that came out of the darkness and to ask ourselves, how can I be a beacon of that light in the world today? How can I be a beacon of that love, of that peace, of that joy, of that abundance, of that greater good? That, ladies and gentlemen, is how we remember, reframe, and honor the past. Let's pray. And so as we turn our attention inward, feeling that part of us at every moment just seeks to be well, to be happy, to be free of any difficulty, any struggle, any sense of lack or fear, and to recognize that as an impulse that lies throughout creation. It is the impulse of that one life, that one power, that one infinite invisible that I call God, out of which everything is created and that lives and moves and has its being in, through, and as all things. I know that this life of God is the very life that animates my being. It is the same life that animates the being of each and every person here, every being everywhere. And I know that as we come together today, looking at this idea of how to remember the past and reframe those situations that still come up as difficult, as painful, and to look deeper to see how in all of this there has always been a presence of good seeking to be known and realized and to honor the ways it has come forth and made itself known. I know that as we do so, not only are we blessed, but we carry that greater consciousness out into the world and bless others. I absolutely give thanks for all, all the human sacrifices that have been made for those who lost their lives for our world to be a greater place today knowing that it was the impulse of love that motivated them, that on the unseen side of life, they feel our love and appreciation because we are still one. And I absolutely know that as we come together as a community to know this truth, we are blessed. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full and grateful heart, I just release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen.